this is part of our Curious Minds series that we, where we invite authors either to campus or virtually to speak to our students about topics of importance or about their books. Some of these talks are virtual, some of them are not, okay? And uh, this book, this series is premised upon the idea that talking about books and ideas is as important educationally as are the books and the subjects themselves, as Gerald Graff once put it. Or as one of our authors last semester put it, Hector Tobar, the exercise of reason is the key, he argued, that opens the door to, of a life, life well lived. And um, so we'd like to welcome today Dan Flores uh, to our series. And he is going to be talking with us about his book, Wild New World, a book that I recommend to everyone. Let me put that for you. Okay, right there. And uh, <clears throat> this has been the winner of the 2023 Rachel Carson Environment Book Award and the winner of the 2023 National Outdoor Book Award for Natural History. Now, last week, of course, we had Daniel Cohen up from Rice University uh, to talk about his book, Confronting Climate Gridlock which was won awarded second place recognition in the Rachel Carson Environmental Book Award. Uh, but today we have uh, Dan. And uh, next week we have one of our own uh, professors, Gerald An Jared Anderson, talking about artificial intelligence and the creative media industries. And is this going to be a tool that they can use or more trouble in the future? So that should be an interesting talk next Thursday at 1230. And that one will be in person. But for today, we have uh, Dan with us, and once I'm done with the introduction, he'll talk about uh, his book and then some of the topics they're in for 35 to 45 minutes. And during the talk, think about questions that you've got, uh, and you can type in the questions in the chat box at the bottom of the page, uh, or the bottom of the screen, excuse me. But the main thing is to enjoy yourself and enjoy what we learned today, um, and think about what you are learning and what difference it might make in your life. And then he's going to address some of these questions about what does he mean by big history? Um, he may be discussing some difficult topics today about extinction and species disappearing and what humans have played in that role. He's going to talk about maybe some of his personal experiences, I'm sure, because he does so in the book throughout. And uh, so maybe give some thought to some of these questions as he's talking. And of course, if you have any questions, type them in the chat box and he'll answer them later in uh, the presentation. And keep in mind, what's the most interesting or surprising thing you learned from uh, Dan today? He's a native of Louisiana, Dan Flores, and a writer who presently lives in the Galisteo Valley outside of Santa Fe, New Mexico. And he's the A.B. Hammond Professor Emeritus of the History of the American West at the University of Montana, Missoula. He's the author of 10 books, most recently the New York Times bestseller, Coyote America, A Natural and Supernatural History, and American Serengeti, The Last Big Animals of the Great Plains. To the surprise winning novelist, Annie Prue has written that his work ranks with that of Thoreau, William Bartram, Aldo Leopold, John Muir, and Peter Matheson. Dr. Flores' essays on the environment, art, and culture of the West have appeared in newspapers like the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, and the Chicago Tribune. We need to get you into the Houston Chronicle, Dan, down here. Uh, <clears throat> and in magazines such as Texas Monthly, Orion, Wild West, Southwest Art, The Big Sky Journal, and High Country News. His work has been honored by the Western Writers of America, the Denver Public Library, the Western Heritage Center, National Cowboy Museum, the High Plains Book Awards, the Montana Book Awards, and the Oklahoma Book Awards, and by the Western History Association, the Montana Historical Society, and the Texas State Historical Association. So without any further ado, Dan, I'm going to turn it over to you, and I'd like to say thank you for being with us today. Welcome, and the floor or the screen is yours. Thank you so much, John, and, and thank you for uh, inviting me to appear in your Curious Minds series. I mean, this is a, a really exciting thing you guys do, and I'm uh, delighted to uh, to be one of the authors that you've asked to appear. 
Um, I'm going to move right into the story I've got to tell you because I think that what you're about to hear is probably not information that you have readily available uh, in your education. I think it's a story that probably most Americans don't really know, or when we did know it perhaps 100 years or so ago, those of us living now have mostly forgotten it. So uh, it's going to be something different. Uh, it's going to be a story about animals and about the, the native species of North America and what happened to them. And, um, and it's a, a fairly complex story because it's what's known as a big history. In other words, I cover an awful lot of ground and I'll explain that to you. I'll, I'll begin this by simply saying that global climate change is not the first time that humanity has remade the earth. My current book, which is called Wild New World, covers a 66 million year story from the Chicxulub impact, that's the asteroid impact that took out the dinosaurs and ushered in the age of mammals, down to early 2022, which was when I submitted the manuscript to my publisher in New York. So I think that kind of coverage probably qualifies it as the kind of book uh, some people refer to as a big history. I was inspired by Yuval Harari's book, Sapiens. If you haven't read that, I certainly recommend it. And by Jared Diamond's various books, uh, things like Guns, Germs, and Steel, for example, which are big history books themselves. But my book forced me to tell a story that takes a kind of 20,000 foot view of human history. In fact, writing Wild New World made me understand how crucial Earth's animal life has been throughout the human story. The biodiversity crisis that we today refer to as the sixth extinction is actually a slow motion phenomenon that we humans initiated long before modern glaciers began to melt. And it long ago began to change the world dramatically. So prepare yourselves for that kind of story. It's going to be a big picture story that starts far back in time, but it's going to using particularly one animal to sort of characterize the American experience with animals. Uh, I'll bring the story up to the present by the time I end. All books, as most of you are aware, exist because writers are compelled by something. And in this case, one of the motivating circumstances to writing Wild New World had to do with my oldest memory. This is a story I tell in the book to help myself and readers understand the ideology that old worlders brought to America with respect to humans and animals. And by old worlders, I'm primarily referring to Europeans. I had my first animal companion, a little yellow chicken, I fed and watered and played with when I was four years old. Our primary play was chase. And although I tell this story in a little more detail in the book, I'll simply summarize by telling you now that one day as we raced through the house, I was a four-year-old, I miscalculated and I stepped on my chicken and I killed her. So as we were burying my little bird, in the backyard, I turned to my mom sobbing with this question. I at least get to have Chicky again in heaven, don't I, mom? A good Southern Methodist who was known all her life for delivering the unpainted version of things, my mother responded with a take on the Western view of animals that has ended up haunting me for a lot of my life. Why no, honey? She said, chickens don't go to heaven. They're different from you and me. They don't have souls. You were made in the image of God and have an everlasting soul. So you'll have a life after death and go to heaven. Animals don't get to do that. They just die. Even as a four-year-old, I can tell you that kind of human exceptionalism rang false to me. But it was an idea that lingered in a disturbing way in my mind for most of my life. And I think it set me on the course to one day write a book like Wild New World, with grapple, which grapples with a lot of these issues. 
I wrote this book for other reasons too. I've more than once been stunned that Americans remember so little about the marvelous biological diversity our continent once held, or understand the realities of how we lost so much magic from the world. Most of us recall a kind of a shorthand story that once there were millions of buffalo in America, then almost none. And that's pretty much what we know about the American animal story. So who of us remembers today that two centuries ago, Atlantic shoreline still har harbored a northern hemisphere penguin, the great auk? That there was still an eastern prairie chicken, the heath hen, until the early 1930s. When my grandparents were alive in Louisiana, passenger pigeons, once the most numerous bird on earth, still flew through American skies. As they had done for 5 million years, wolves were still engineering continental ecologies everywhere until a century ago. America's own parrot, the Carolina parakeet, continued to lend a tropical color to eastern forests only 90 years ago. And giant ivory-billed woodpeckers were yet available for ornithologists to study into the 1940s. Henry David Thoreau once lamented that in 1850s New England, he was not able to experience what he called an entire heaven and an entire earth. I use that phrase from Thoreau as a title for one of my chapters because so few modern Americans seem to understand what having an entire earth might have meant that what happened in the past creates the reality that we all live in now. That absence of memory doesn't just make recovery of wolves under the Endangered Species Act more difficult in our own time. It sometimes makes me wonder about our inability to grasp that the past doesn't stay in the past. And whether humans two or three centuries from now will even understand that they live on an earth previous generations overheated, whether they'll wonder what the planet was once like, or just assume that the world they live in is normal the way most of us do about our own world. So a book that covers 66 million years obviously gets to engage in a great many topics, and I can't talk about all of them here, obviously. But before I start discussing one of them as an example, let me mention a few that I try to cover in this book, and I'll just mention them to give you some idea of what this book is about. Among them is how America acquired that rich, distinctive bestiary that greeted the first human arrivals so many thousands of years ago. How did we come to have the animals that humans found here? Humanity's deep time and intimate relationships with other animals is another theme. Manifest as a part of a surviving, down to the day, human neurological and limbic hard wiring that still reacts to the other creatures around us. The book investigates American elephants and why we no longer have them. How a people who established our first coast-to-coast -coast culture 13,000 years ago, I refer to this culture in the book with a title for a chapter called Clovisia the Beautiful, and how that culture 13,000 years ago forever transformed the ecologies on our continent. How it was that in the 10,000 years that followed that, Native people largely managed to preserve American biological diversity and how they did that. How naturalists, American naturalists like Mark Catesby, if you've not heard some of these names, uh, this is a book at least that will make you familiar with them. Mark Catesby, William Bartram, John James Audubon, Ernest Thompson Seton, Vernon Bailey, and Florence Miriam Bailey, Adolf and Olas Murray, Aldo Leopold, and Rachel Carson. How all these kinds of American naturalists unlock the secrets of our wild animals. Why Euro-Americans were so invested from the very first in destroying the continent's wolves. Why bison aren't wild in modern America. And how in the process of creating what we've long called the greatest nation on earth, America's economy 
made possible 400 years of the most widespread destruction of animals anywhere in modern world history. And then we call that an act of civilization. So this story I tell involves several theories. And what I want to explain to you briefly is one called a theory of first contact. And here's what I mean by that. The Americas were the last continents on earth that humans found. And we were repeatedly new to the place. First contact theory assumes that beings can only respond to the new with the ideas that are already in their heads. So first contact in several forms, biological first contact, where animals with no prior experience with us had to learn to fear us. Cultural first contact, when Europeans and native people engaged in big misses about one another, play a significant role in Wild New World. But I also write about something called continental first contact, when more recent Americans failed to appreciate the ancient ecologies we had inherited here. Acting on old world traditions, we tried to remake America in the image of Europe, of a part of the world that had long before destroyed its own largest and most charismatic animals. And even when the United States created a system of vast public lands, unlike anything Europe possessed, with respect to wild animals, we still struggled to imagine our way out of the blinders of continental first contact. So to continue with this for a few more minutes before I turn to a particular animal to discuss American traditions and themes, Another idea that I investigate in this book is the thoughts that are in our heads about animals. I'm concerned throughout the story with how humans saw themselves in relationship to the other animals around them. That included Neanderthal practices, for example, as well as the 35,000 year old art that we humans once painted on the cave walls of Western Europe. It was in part, our oldest form of worship, really. And it featured something that we might find kind of quaint or unsuspected today, what anthropologists refer to as therianthrope images, figures that merge human beings and other animals, often lions or bison, into one creature. For example, in Chauvet Cave, a 35,000-year-old uh, uh, cave art in Western France, there is a figure of a woman and a bison merged into one creature. And as you walk around this particular image, on one side, it looks like a bison. On the other side, it looks like a human female. And as you circle it, you realize that the two creatures are one. This is something that we did anciently for many, many thousands of years. And it's a kind of a preservation of ancient kinship between humans and other creatures that I think Native Americans preserved in North America prior to the arrival of people from Europe. America's indigenous stories, in fact, are often accounts of kinship ceremonies performed to placate animal gods so that when humans overreached or fail to pay proper respect, ceremonies could repair the rifts between humans and other animals. And I've always loved the poetry of this line. When those ceremonies worked, the animals came dancing, many of the accounts say. Europeans arrived with different religious ideas, obviously, ideas that sprang from a long tradition of herding domesticated animals. From Greek and biblical sources, Europeans believed we were made in the exact image of a deity who lived in the sky, and we were convinced as a result that we possessed a magical, immortal spirit, that story that my mother told me when I was four years old. Thus, we were exceptional among all animals. We brought with us from Europe a religious book asserting at every reading that God had created other animals solely for human use. Into your hand are they delivered, the book of Genesis proclaims. As religions do, Judeo-Christianity explained how the world works. 
since a deity had created everything on earth in a state of perfection, extinction was impossible. Religious scholars believed that predators like wolves and annoyance to old worlders domesticated herds of sheep and goats and cattle originated with Adam's fall from grace and that destroying them could recreate humanity's original situation in the Garden of Eden. And the capitalist market allowed Europeans to see the wild creatures of America as a form of potential wealth, not living kin, but natural resources and commodities in a global market economy. So think about it. In an early United States, where citizens believed that animals should be sources of wealth and who believed that extinction could never happen because creation had made a perfect world, cracking this dam of old world certitude to see reality eventually would require a genius like a Charles Darwin, whose blockbuster books revealed the great secret of evolution, verifying with science the ancient dictum that we were the same as all the life around us. We humans were simply another spawn of Earth's evolutionary river. It's important to remember, I think, in talking about Darwin though, that the first of Darwin's books on the origin of species is only 164 years old. Human exceptionalism has the inertia, obviously, of millennia. And finally, there's also that sixth extinction, which has different origins than most of us assume. Unlike the fifth extinction on Earth, when that asteroid strike wiped out 75% of Earth life in weeks, the sixth extinction is human cause, and it's unspooled across the last 25 or 30,000 years on Earth. In fact, a 2018 National Academy of Science study described the loss of 300 mammal species. I mean, think about that, 300 species and two and a half billion years of accumulated distinctive genetics as we humans spread around the world as close to a worst case scenario in terms of wild animals. Then starting five centuries ago, once we were here, scores of remaining species, many of them like passenger pigeons, that had been in America for 15 million years, proved incapable of surviving a mere 400 years as targets of capitalism. Those losses since 1500, during which America's great ox, passenger pigeons, parents, ivory bills, and many, many others became direct or indirect victims of capitalism, cost us another half billion years of Earth's evolved faunal genetics. So let me turn at this point to a specific animal to try to give you an idea of how this played out in a more specific way in American history. I mean, I try to take seriously the stories of a lot of different animals in Wild New World, from hummingbirds to grizzly bears. And I try to track animals, for example, like horses that evolved and lived here for 50 million years before becoming extinct and then having us return them 500 years ago. Or beavers and sea otters on whose backs the first American millionaires were made. But it's very likely that no American wild animal gives us such a revealing look at our soul as a country as how we reacted to the wolves that had been here for 5 million years. And it's also a story that demonstrates all too well that what happened in the past doesn't stay in the past, since we're still grappling with the wolf story today. So let me tell you briefly that the legendary family of the Canids, the wolves and dogs of the world, are indigenous American animals in their origins. The canid family evolved in America some 5.3 million years ago and then spread around the globe. Some 30,000 years ago, American wolves, animals that had remained in North America, along with dire wolves and coyotes, those that also remained in America, were joined by migrating waves of gray wolves beginning to return home from a couple of million years spent in Eurasia. 
In fact, we think that that's what happened to dire wolves when gray wolves came back to North America. Gray wolves probably outcompeted dire wolves and drove them to extinction. In an ancient North America inhabited by a native people who never domesticated and herded wild ungulates, wolves, coyotes, and other predators freely got to play their ancient roles as keystone animals, shaping continental ecologies from the top down, right down to the kind of plants that grew in America. But that role got challenged with the arrival of people from Europe 400 years ago. The Puritan colony in Massachusetts, for example, was barely a decade old when in his book, New England's Prospect, William Wood wrote of the wolf as a very special problem for colonizers. True, since in America, as he put it, it was never yet known that a wolf ever set upon a man or a woman. These wolves in America seemed different from those in Europe's fairy tales and memories where wolves were always pursuing people. But wolves in the kind of numbers Europeans found were unexpected. Wood, in fact, was the first to imagine how wonderfully splendid a wolf-free America might be. But in the 1630s, New England, he despaired because he thought there was just little hope of their utter destruction. So from the start, the wolf was an American animal of special concern for Europeans. But the question, of course, is why was that the case? Part of the answer seems to be unfamiliarity. England's wolves hadn't lasted beyond the 1400s. So Virginians and New Englanders were living among wolves for the first time in their lives. And as William Wood implied, they didn't like it in the least. Then there were their imported cultural traditions. When you had herded domestic animals for 8,000 years and religion was your way of understanding the world, it was easy to see wolves as a kind of a supernatural malediction. After all, as many people pointed out in colonial America, didn't wolves share the yellow eyes that medieval illustration often gave to Satan? Hmm. The eastern wolves that were found in northern New England and red wolves, which range from Texas to southern New England, were the common devourers that Wood warned about. Canids distinct from the gray wolves that were further west. Some of these wolves were black, which was another suspicious mark. While Abenakis and Narragansetts, the native people on the scene in New England, admired wolves for their bravery, their hunting skills, and their devotion to their families and their mates, Europeans saw those very same animals as degenerate cowards, the very definition of evil and cruelty in nature. Particularly since real wolves bore little resemblance to the animals in the stories that Europeans have brought with them, it's kind of difficult to look back on this history without feeling, and this is the way I felt when I was working on this and writing it, real moral outrage about how these unsuspecting animals must have experienced colonialism. Because the reality was that wolf social lives and ecological niches were actually similar to our own, which is, of course is why tamed wolves in the form of dogs became our first companion animals. Wolf societies were configured a lot like hunter and gatherer human bands. And in both those, the leadership tended to be female or matriarchal. While the alpha wolf directs the pack's movements, the larger males, especially those between about two and five years old, were the primary hunters. Europeans imagined America's wolves as vicious, efficient, killing monsters. In the real world, a very different process was playing out chasing down and neck wrestling big animals that were armed with hooves and antlers is dangerous in the extreme for wolves. And so wolves go for the low hanging fruit. They scavenge animals that are already killed when possible. And when they are on the hunt, they try for fawns, young animals, or injured, diseased, or old ones that are easier to take down without suffering injury. Even then, among the white-tailed deer that wolves are primarily hunting in the eastern forests of colonial America, 
Wolf Chase success could dip as low as 10%. In other words, nine times out of 10, when they pursued a deer, they would never catch it. But wolf natural history like this was completely invisible to the early European colonists because what these new settlers, settlers really wanted was a wolf-free America. In fact, Woods, Massachusetts colony passed the first wildlife law in colonial American history. It was a one penny bounty on dead wolves. That was our first environmental law in America. John James Audubon left us with a chilling account of how wolves experienced this war on them in early America. Audubon wrote about this in 1814 when the attitudes of Americans towards wolves had hardened into a rare viciousness. Spending the night with a farmer on the Vincennes Trace, Audubon accompanied his host to a capture pit that held three wolves. The wolves sinned, they had attacked the farmer's loose stock in a country by then bled of almost all of its deer, bison, and elk. Climbing into the pit, the farmer one by one severed the wolf's hamstrings with a pocket knife, exhibiting as little fear as if he had been marking lambs, Audubon wrote. Then the farmer dragged the wolves out so his dogs could tear them to pieces. Audubon helped him pull up the largest of the three, a black male wolf in the prime of life. The naturalist described this beast of old world horror stories as motionless with fright, as if dead, its disabled legs swinging to and fro, its jaws wide open, and the gurgle in its throat alone indicating that it was actually alive. Petrified with fear, the black wolf offered no resistance. It took the dogs less than a minute to stop the gurgling and extinguish his life. Over the ensuing centuries, Americans who saw wild animals as, as little more than body parts for a market economy engaged in many an unspeakable act of slaughter against everything from passenger pigeons and waterfowl to the largest, most charismatic herd animals on the continent. But wolves came in for a particularly wanton cruelty. No Western movie, for example, has ever cast a character in the once viable rural occupation role known as Wolfer. But when strychnine poison became cheaply available in America in 1834, with no restrictions whatsoever on its use, poisons offered a new way to make money off nature. So unlike trapping or shooting, Poisoning didn't even require any skill. You just baited a carcass, often a killed horse, and then headed to camp to enjoy life while strychnine did its work. You called yourself, as you did this, a wolfer by trade. Approaching a carcass that they had baited like this, wolfers would start finding victims a quarter of a mile from the bait animal, appearing sprayed across the landscape as if by some spinning centrifuge. The details are gruesome. Strychnine kills through asphyxiation, a death preceded by convulsive cramping so violent that it almost twisted an animal to death. A party in the Texas panhandle picked up 64 wrenched, twisted wolf bodies one morning, barely a mile from their camp. They made $4,000, the equivalent of $93,000 today in one winter. In Kansas, a wolfer named James Mead once poisoned 82 wolves in one single day's baiting. Montana's territorial government was so committed to shielding cattle and sheep raisers from predators that it spent a whopping two-thirds of its annual budgets supporting wolfers in the territory. Between 1883 and 1928, Montana as a territory and state shelled out the money to kill an astounding 111,554 wolves and 886,367 coyotes.
But it's a mistake if you think of the wolf story of this age as a kind of a bespoke and singular thing. By the 1880s, great off penguins had been extinct for 40 years. Sea otters were on the verge of extinction. And we had in a single century taken bison populations from 30 million to fewer than a thousand of them left. In one year, the breeding plumes, the feathers of 193,000 egrets and herons killed on their nests by Southern market hunters to supply feathers for women's hats went on sale in London's commercial sales rooms. In a single week, get this, in 1886, the skins of 400,000 American hummingbirds sold in those same rooms. Market hunters in Bozeman, Montana in 1883 made the equivalent of $1.6 million killing elk, bighorn sheep, pronghorn antelope, mule deer, wolves, coyotes, and selling their body parts to the market. At the same time, vast passenger pigeon nestings like those in 1870s Wisconsin, nestings that had covered almost a thousand square miles, were being destroyed in an instant. A hundred thousand frenzied hunters had descended on those nestings, and as one observer put it, the slaughter was terrible beyond any description. The scene was truly pitiable. I'll say it again because of how shocking it is. Passenger pigeons had been in America for 15 million years. By 1914, every last one of them was gone. In this ability to kill animals en masse, Americans were absolutely unmatched. By the 1920s, as flappers and jazz and Hollywood were captivating American cities, the wolf, though, had become a kind of golden-eyed lightning rod that distilled much of the American wildlife story, attempts to make the United States into a clone of Europe, the loss of so many of our ancient species, and a battle between advocates of the old folklore traditions of Europe and those of the brand new science of ecology. In an act of self-preservation, by a century ago, the nascent United States Fish and Wildlife Service, which was then called the Biological Survey, started its history by making itself into the solution to the country's predator problem. One of its most famous employees, a naive country boy from Minnesota named Vernon Bailey, had transformed himself into the wolf-killing federal guru that Teddy Roosevelt would nickname Wolf Bailey. Everywhere this wolf war was waged on behalf of civilization, livestock interests, and increasingly now, sport hunters. In other words, we'll kill the predators so that sport hunters will have more elk and deer to shoot. If your assignment, Ben, was to exterminate the wolf in America, the modern way of doing it in the 20th century wasn't shooting or trapping, but poisoning entire populations. So with new funding, the Biological Survey proceeded to build a plant in Albuquerque, New Mexico to produce strychnine baits in volume. And chillingly and unsentimentally, it called that plant the Eradication Methods Lab. By the 1920s, the Eradication Methods Lab was churning out 300 and mil 300, I'm sorry, three and a half million poison baits a year to kill American predators. At one point, Vernon Bailey inquired of his boss, Seahart Miriam, about the proper dose of strychnine to kill a wolf in a humane three minutes. With any expression of mercy towards wolves, a political faux pas in those days, Miriam shot back to Bailey, You'd better go at once to the hospital in Albuquerque inasmuch as no sane man could possibly make such an absurd and utterly preposterous statement as this. You're obviously in need of mental treatment. Miriam went on and said this, we want the cattleman behind us, understand? Federal hunters quickly grasped that the wolf's fatal flaw 
was its loyalty to its family groups. Such was the wolf's affection for mates, pups, and pack members that killing one meant, as one bureau hunter put it, that you could quickly kill all of the members of whole families of wolves with unmistakable evidence that the remaining members of the wolf family had been seeking the lost member. If you killed one, you baited your traps or your bait animals with the scent of the animal you had killed, and you could end up killing the entire pack. The architects of this program took their message to the American public with a series of canned newspaper articles that were very similar to those lauding the G-men who were hunting crime celebrities like Al Capone and John Dillinger in the 1930s. One of those stories read as a headline, U.S. agents stalked the desperados of the animal world with pictures accompanying it of wolves and bears and mountain lions. In the mid-1940s, two of those federal architects, Stanley Young and E.A. Goldman, finally published their coda to centuries of American wolf killing. It was called The Wolves of North America. And at the time they wrote it, they exulted that over most of North America and the entire East, wolves were entirely gone. The authors treated this as the celebration of a four century victory, something like defeating Nazi Germany and Japan. So as I get to the end of this, I want to point out how the world began to shift. And here's how it happened. There was a distinct group in America though, for which a wolf free country did not seem like a celebratory thing. Without bothering to research its assumptions, the biological survey had reflexively adopted the European folk position about wolves. Predators were disposable, and America modeled on Europe demanded their absence. But from the 1920s through the middle of the 20th century, disciples of a brand new science called ecology began to argue that there might be ancient and dynamic equilibria at work in, a, in America that had long featured wolves. And the way to find that out was actually to research the role that wolves had always played in American ecologies. Another way might be to offer predators like wolves permanent refuge in America's national parks. That was an idea that dumbfounded the American Biological Survey. Its director told his employees in 1931, we actually faced the opposition, he said, of those who want to see the mountain lion, the wolf, the coyote, and the bobcat perpetuated as part of the wildlife of this country. One of the scientists who was really interested in all this was a young Yale-trained forester named Aldo Leopold. Posted to the Carson National Forest in New Mexico, Leopold met Estella Berger, the woman who would become his wife, whose brother happened to be the president of the New Mexico Wool Growers Association. But Leopold was one of those kind of people who soaked up the world with an open mind. And one of the issues he began to study was the response of prey animals to predator removal. He did so because of a new phenomenon in America, the explosion and then rapid die-off of deer, elk, and moose populations in places where predators had been removed. Ecologists began to call this an eruption. Leopold could find records of only two eruptions that had ever happened before 1900, but a whopping 42 of them in America between 1900 and 1945. At the same time Leopold was studying eruptions, a National Park Service ecologist named Adolf Murray finally landed the research project that the ecologists were calling for. By the middle of the 20th century, Mount McKinley in Alaska was the only park that still had any wolves though. So Murray went to Alaska and spent three years engaged in the unthinkable, actually observing and studying wolves, interacting among themselves and with their prey. And he wrote a classic book out of that called The Wolves of Mount McKinley, which if you've never read, I encourage you to read as kind of the beginnings of a huge ship in America about the role of animals in our history. 
Murray did one other thing in this book that readers of his book never forgot. He brought the wolves he studied to life as individuals. He gave them names like Dandy and Robber Mask and Grandpa, all of them with unique pers personalities. These were not the wolves portrayed by the folklore of the old world. Old world. They were the wolves that the Bureau of uh, the Bureau's public relations articles had implied were the gangsters of the animal world. They were the real wolves that had been in America all along. So the wolves of Mount McKinley became our first modern sensibility about predators in the United States in the 20th century. Leopold got to review that book, The Wolves of North America, that the Bureau men had written. But in his review of it, he wrote that it was not a scientific book, but reflected the naturalist of the past rather than the wildlife ecologist of the day. Leopold finally published his great book in 1949, A Sand County Almanac, which was a real game changer in this story because in vivid poetic passages, he introduced the world to insights that were real epiphanies for the emerging uh, decades of ecology in the United States. The genius that had built the United States had always been self-interest, Leopold said, but he went on to write that an act is right when it preserves not humanity or economics, but the rights of other species around us, the community that we all occupy, among those rights being the simple right to exist. One of the great scenes in that book that those of you who have read it will always remember is Leopold's story about having shot a wolf himself and watching the green fire die in its eyes and later coming to realize what a miscalculation he had made. I was wrong, he says in this book, but it's not too late either for me or for you. So I'm gonna close this out. Uh, it's gonna take me about two minutes to close it and I'll do it this way. Through a lot of our history, we've told ourselves that apart from the few species that we saved to be able to hunt, it was inevitable that most of our big charismatic wild animals vanish. They were just the collateral damage of progress and prosperity. In fact, though, losing animals or saving them has usually been a deliberate choice. And 50 years ago, last year, in 2023, we made the very deliberate choice in the United States to pass the Endangered Species Act of 1973, which began to reverse the mindless destruction that had stood as shorthand for the American wild animal story. The Endangered Species Act rested on a premise that other living species, with which both indigenous philosophies and Darwinism, remember, teach us are our earthly kin, possess an essential right, the right to exist. The United States Supreme Court called the Endangered Species Act the most comprehensive legislation for saving species ever enacted by any nation. And I argue in Wild New World that the passage of the ESA is one of those American moments joining the writing of the Declaration of Independence, the abolition of slavery, the creation of natural parks that shows who we are as a people, an instinct to extend rights and protections to the marginalized. The endangered species became law back when saving the world wasn't political. It passed 492 to 12 in Congress. I mean, can you imagine anything passing by a margin like that today? And it hasn't just brought back bald eagles and California condors and wolves and recovered more than 50 other species. In the International Union for the Conservation of Nature's new green status list, the United States now fares significantly better than most any country in the world because of the Endangered Species Act and our recovery programs to try to bring back animals that are on the brink. Despite our own success with the ESA and our restoration pro projects on a global scale today, 
a third of the planet's 27,000 vertebrate species are now in decline, with a quarter of them now possibly facing extinction. Since the 1970s, in the United States, our bird population has dropped by 29%. And we're one of the best countries in the world. As a result of climate change, a third to a half of American species, at least the ones that can do so, are shifting their ranges, which is scrambling ecologies all over the, all over the continent. And while we're still hoping for grand projects like recovering jaguars in the Southwest or allowing bison to be wild again, we continue to lose species from that earlier phase in our history when we de-buffalo, de-wolfed, and de-pigeon the continent. But I have to tell you that in the big context of our national story, the Endangered Species Act remains today on the short list of America's very best ideas. It's proof, in fact, that nothing in history is truly inevitable. So in a nation that endeavors to lead the world by example, in the Endangered Species Act, we've got evidence, at least, that change is within us. When we needed a Hail Mary to slow and even reverse what seemed all these unstoppable forces of destruction, we Americans actually managed to pull it off. So that gives me hope that the mindless human destruction that we've engaged in for so long is not inevitable that we can, in fact, save the world and live, hopefully, in an entire heaven and an entire earth. Okay, I will stop. I've given you plenty to chew on. And so whatever thoughts or ideas or questions you have, I'm certainly willing to take them on. Okay, we've got a few. Uh, Lorelai, you had you typed in the first question. Do you want to ask it or do you want me to read it? Lorelai, can you hear me? She says she's in a public space, so could oh, you read it? Okay, I see. Okay, yes, I'll read it aloud. All right. Uh, she asked, what did Europeans... Um, who came to America, what did they think of Native Americans tamed to dogs? Uh, was a similar feeling to use the animals for profit, or did they see those dogs as similar to their own dogs? Well, that's, uh, I'll admit, that's a question that I've, I've not done any research on. Um, certainly, Europeans saw Native people with dogs, and sometimes in times of hunger, Native people, of course, would uh, use dogs uh, as a meal. They would eat them. But, I mean, I think the question that I was engaged with in Wild New World was more the relationship between uh, these two groups, Europeans and Native people, and various kinds of Native people, obviously, of many different tribal uh, groups and nations, and the wild animals that were around them. Dogs, neither on the European side nor the native side, ever played the role uh, of a kind of a commodity product in the market economy. So the focus that I had uh, tended to be on the animals that uh, both groups were using. And I mean, my book obviously doesn't shy away from recognizing that native people did play a role in the market economy. And they did so primarily because Europeans offered them a transformative technology uh, in the form of steel and iron implements, which if they didn't participate in, they tended to shortchange themselves with respect to their competitors down the river or in the next valley. And so Native people uh, do engage in the market economy, but it is a it is a hunt for wild creatures and not the domesticated ones. Okay, the next question is from Adnan, and he asks, I thought this might come up, what do you think about the idea of some scientists about bringing back animals? Is that feasible, uh, you know, bringing back the woolly mammoth, for example, or is that really a fantasy? Uh, well, let me uh, let me make a confession to you. I am on the conservation advisory board of uh, Colossal Biosciences, which is the primary organization in the United States that is engaged in 
uh, attempting de-extinction. Um, so I have, uh, I wrote about uh, this story, the de-extinction story, using CRISPR genetics to try to, for example, uh, rescue passenger pigeons from extinction or, or mammoths from extinction in Wild New World. Uh, and that was uh, before I joined the, uh, the advisory board of, of Colossal. So I've got a little bit of an insight into how it's working. I mean, I can tell you right now that uh, it's probably going to happen. And I think the first animal that's likely uh, to experience a de-extinction is uh, the woolly mammoth. Uh, the birds are turning out to be more difficult than scientists had thought. Uh, the woolly mammoth is probably maybe only a decade away. And so we're going to we're going to see a woolly mammoth rescued. Uh, what my concern has been, and in the meetings that we have in the Conservation Advisory Board, and Colossal, by the way, is engaged in all sorts of endangered species recovery as well as de-extinction efforts. But my concern has been whether or not we can actually introduce some of these animals into the wild. And part of my thinking, and this is the way I approach it in Wild New World in the epilogue, is that you can't just take a single animal and put it in nature and expect it to behave the way woolly mammoths, for example, behaved 10,000 years ago in North America, because it's not going to be surrounded by the other species that made up the entire ecology that it existed in. And so one of the questions that uh, that Colossal, for example, is grappling with is whether or not it's going to be possible to introduce a predator uh, to also be become a, a de-extinction candidate along with woolly mammoths. So that's kind of where it is. And I think it's probably going to be a decade away before anyone gets to see a woolly mammoth, but I do think it's probably coming. Wow. Okay, the next question is from Steve. And uh, it the question is, is it important, do you think that man-eating predators continue to exist? And if so, why? Uh, <laughs> well, here, that's, a, that's an interesting phrasing because I'm, I struggle to find, with the possible exception, perhaps, of tigers uh, in, uh, in the jungle forests of, uh, of Asia, I struggle to find any predators that are reared because most animals, just like us, uh, have to acculturate their young and train them into what the proper prey species are. I don't, I'm not aware of grizzly bears, polar bears, or wolves, or mountain lions training their cubs that humans are a part of their normal prey base. Attacks on humans occur, but they don't really occur because grizzly bears are going to go into the outskirts of, of Bozeman, Montana, and start picking off people as an ordinary part of their prey base. What you tend to have happen whenever an animal begins to kill uh, humans is that it's a singular event that often is not followed up by another attack. Although we do, wildlife biologists do, whenever an animal attack results in mortality for a human, they usually do find the animal and try to take it out of the population. Just in case, it might teach another animal, a bear or a mountain lion, to do this. But uh, the term, uh, I kind of got thrown by the term man-eating predators there because that's not a common feature for uh, grizzly bears or wolves or mountain lions. They don't go around searching out humans to kill and eat. Okay, the last question is from an audience member who prefers to remain nameless. Uh, and the question is, is, what are you optimistic about with regards to animals? Well, I think, uh, and that's the reason I didn't want to cut that that talk short. I didn't want to get in that last two or three minutes uh, with respect to the Endangered Species Act. Um, because I worked on this book for quite a number of years, 
and immerse myself in some of those stories that I was telling you about. And obviously those stories are not easy to absorb and come away with a very uh, beneficent opinion yeah. about some of our ancestors and how they treated the animal world. Uh, I could have let this book stop, say in 1950, and it would have been a pessimistic story. But I think as a result of, once again, science, particularly ecology, the ecological sciences, beginning to teach us by sometime in about the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, about how the world works and the role that other animals and we ourselves play in it, I began to develop a much more positive opinion about what we were going to do in the United States. And of course, the story that I told at the end of this talk about the passage of the Endangered Species Act was our effort to try to reverse what had happened. I mean, had we not done that, then this would have been a wholly pessimistic story. We would have lost numerous species. We would have lost our national symbol, for example. We would have had to come up with something else than bald eagles to represent the United States to the world because bald eagles were nearly gone yeah. when the Endangered Species Act was passed. So I'm optimistic that we have managed to save more than 50 species. We've got something like 1,600 creatures on the endangered and threatened species list. We've rescued 50 so far. We've got an awful lot more where the story is pending. We don't know how it's going to turn out. But because we had a recovery project appended to the Endangered Species Act, we have managed to do things like recover eagles, recover uh, California condors, recover wolves, which is happening in the United States today. And so the story seems a lot more positive than it would have been had we just continued with yeah. this project of wiping out one species after another and paying no attention to the fact that they were gone. I would like to recommend the book to everyone, Wild New World, The Epic Story of Animals and People in America. Those of you who are on the faculty, please put your name in the chat box for me so I can make sure you get the professional development for this. Dan, we'd like to thank you for your time and for this wonderful book. I uh, would like to encourage everyone in the audience to get it as soon as possible and read it. It'll give you a different perspective on our past and on our present, I think, as well. So thanks to everyone, and thank you, Dan. Thank you, John, and thank you all for, for attending. Much appreciated. Yeah.